Hi everybody, my name is Jack Parrish. I am a flight instructor and former airline pilot and I'm going to be doing a ground today with Terrell. His check ride is coming up soon for the private pilot license so we're going to see where he's at with a mock check ride. So uh, take some notes, take them to your instructor after you watch the video and let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to do just some rapid fire and if we find an area where there's some weakness we may go a little bit deeper into it and we may hit on some scenarios today too okay. uh, but i know you're still going to do one more mock oral with the chief pilot before you check right so is that tim yeah okay i uh, know with thomas okay yeah, yeah. yeah all right so let's get started what are the privileges and limitations of a private pilot so as a private pilot i may act as pilot in command may carry passengers. I also may carry passenger. I mean, I also may uh, act as pilot man command for a charitable event. I may act as a salesman if I have 200 hours plus. Some limitations is I may not pay less than the prorated share, you know, for all fuel. And I may not uh, carry passengers for all property for hire. Okay. You mentioned being an aircraft salesman. You need 200 hours. What kind of hours do you need? Pilot and command hours. Pilot and command. Good. Okay. Let's see. What do you need with you physically with you when you fly a plane as pilot and command? Uh, I would need my medical photo ID and also my private pilot license. Okay. As a private pilot. Very good. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the one difference between private and student for that? Well, as a student, I would also need a logbook. So my for endorsement purposes. It's your endorsements. Yeah. Good. Okay, um, so you mentioned your medical. How, when does, do you know when your medical expires? My medical expires, so it has a 60 calendar month uh, window. So it expires in 60 calendar months. 60 calendar months, okay. Uh -huh. Nice. Let's see, when would, so what class is yours? What class Mine is, is a first class medical. Okay, yeah. and you said 60 calendar months though, so what so, changes? So, um, so after the first 12 months of my medical, um, it reverts down to third class privileges. So, mm -hmm. um, so that final 48 calendar months will be third class privileges. Okay, nice. Third class privileges, I like the way you said that. Let's see, if you were, let's say you were 54, how long would you have first class privileges for? Uh, if I were 54, my first class privilege would only last six calendar months. Okay, very good. Yep, my dad, he's at the airlines. He's got to go every every <laughs> six months. Nice. Okay, uh, you also mentioned your pilot certificate. Uh, does that ever expire? It doesn't expire, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned government ID. Uh, what could what counts as ID? What, what uh, do you government use? Government issued ID, so driver's license, passport, or just a state issued ID. Okay, uh, nice. All right, let's see. Let's say you take your cousin. Darren's your cousin, right? Yeah. Okay, you take your cousin Darren up. Uh, do you have to log that flight? I don't have to. No, I don't. Okay, and in what conditions do you have to log flight time? Like if I was getting like a rating or doing a flight review, then uh, I would have to log that time. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so time towards towards something. What, what other conditions would require us to log it? To log that time. You can't always, if you're struggling to find it, you can always go to the table of contents for that part. You're in the right part. but So like just, the, just like the front part, right? Like yeah, the, the, the very 61. beginning of 61. That might make it a little quicker to find it. So pilot log books, 6151. Ooh, we found it. So you were on the right track. The things you said were correct, but you were there was one thing that you, you didn't quite say. Okay. And when there's a question like this with the examiner that you're allowed to look up, don't feel rushed, you know? Yeah. If it takes you a minute to find it, that is totally okay. I know looking something up with the examiner like yeah. sitting there can be intimidating. Training and I used to meet requirements of it, right? Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, so training and aeronautical experience used to meet requirements for a certificate, rating, or a flight review of this part. Mm, so flight review, Yeah. what's that? A flight review is something we have to do every 24 calendar months to keep our li uh, pilot license. Yeah. What, what category would that be? So you got your certificates, ratings, or recency, right? Mm -hmm. Recency, Yeah. right? Okay, so that's the one thing that I was looking for that recency. I didn't hear you say. Gotcha. Yeah, so recency. And then do you have to log uh, your landings for currency for PIC with passengers? So yeah, if, uh, if I'm carrying passengers, I do have to log my landings. Okay, yeah, you'd want to you'd yeah. log that as well. Okay, all right, so 6151 with the regulation there, right, mm -hmm. for, for that. You knew where to find it, but just if you're going to read a regulation to find something, start in the beginning because sometimes there's a regulation that goes a couple pages, and if you go start looking in the end, they can get into the weeds with different systems. Scenarios. So just yeah. start in the beginning. They'll usually give you like the overview in the beginning, and that was where that was where that was was right in the beginning. Nice. There. Okay. All right. So you said the flight review for 24 calendar months, and that is to do what? Does that enable you to do? 
Oh, so that keeps our, that the, the flight review every 24 calendar months keeps our private pilot license active, valid, so to say, or well, current, keeps us current. So Yeah, it keeps you current, right? Yeah. Your certificate's not gonna expire or anything, but it allows you to do something specific, uh, to act as pilot in command. Act as pilot in command, right? Yes. Act as pilot in command. And then what do the landings do differently than that? So, uh, so for landings, uh, I for my landings is for me to be able to carry passengers. Right. So PIC is flight review, right? And mm -hmm. then the landings is for PIC with passengers, passengers, right? Gotcha. Okay. Very good. All right. Now let's say you're gonna take you're gonna take Darren up, and you got your license. You're gonna go take him to. You guys are gonna go on a flight cross country, and it's gonna be from let's say 5 p.m. and you're gonna land at around 9 p.m. What else would you need to consider with your your landing currency? So uh, if I'm landing at 9 p.m., I know that my landings have to be made is an hour after sunset. Okay. So I keep that in mind, knowing that I would only calculate the landings. Let's say we were to divert or something like that and land and get fuel or something mm -hmm. like that. I know I can only count those landings that were an hour, but were made an hour after sunset. Okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So for but for the landings, because um, you have to do your three mm -hmm. landings before that flight, oh, right? Oh, so you meant for at nighttime, then I would have to make sure those that landing was those three landings were to a full stop. Okay, to yeah. a full stop. Very good. All right. Uh, now you brought up uh, the nighttime, an hour after sunset. You said. Mm -hmm. So when can you log uh, night flight time? So civil civil evening twilight. Okay. So yeah. All right. Nice. Do you know when that is? Yes, uh, six degrees. That'll be six degrees below the horizon. Nice. What yeah. is six degrees? The angle of the sun is below the horizon, I guess. Yeah, yeah. the center of the sun, essentially. Okay. If yeah. you don't know, it's you could look it up and see the exact time. It's roughly 30 minutes, mm -hmm. right? But um, it's not exactly 30 minutes. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so you got that for currency. Let's see. Okay, um, let's say you, where, where about in town do you live right now? Raleigh. In Rowlett, let's mm -hmm. say you moved from Rowlett and you moved, uh, say you wanted to move closer to the school, you moved to the Bishop Arts area. Mm -hmm. What would you have to, to do as far as the FAA is concerned? Well, I have to make sure I report that my address changed within 30 days. Okay, within 30 days. Yeah. How can you determine if your airplane is equipped with a Mode C transponder? How do you know what type of transponder it is? I'm not sure. It's okay. I would say that's kind of a harder question. But uh, the equipment list on the weight and balance, there's an equipment list. For the plane, so okay. it would say on there what type of transponder. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're gonna go and you're gonna do this flight with Darren. You guys are gonna fly. Let's keep that scenario going. You're gonna fly from I think I said uh, 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. You're gonna go on a cross country. Let's say you're going from here to Monroe, and um, you're gonna go and take the plane. So you're doing your pre-flight. What do you need to check for the aircraft to make sure that you're legal to fly? So for the aircraft, uh, I would make make sure that I have my airworthiness certificate. Um, <clears throat> my registration, uh, POH, so operating handbook, and uh, radio, radio, uh, radio license, and weight and balance equipment list. Do you need a radio license to go from here to Monroe? I don't need it to go from here to Monroe, no. Okay, you just <laughs> like having it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so you said airworthiness. Does that expire? Uh, my airworthiness certificate does not expire as long as I adhere to my uh, airworthiness directives. Okay, and where does the airworthiness certificate need to be? Can it be in the back of the seat? No, it, it needs to be visible either um, in the cabin or in the cockpit. Okay. So, yeah. All right, very nice. Uh, what about the registration? Does that expire? Registration does expire uh, every three years, but I know that's changing to seven or it just already changed. changed. Yep, yeah, it did already seven. change. Yep. Yeah. Just happened seven years. You're correct about that. Yeah. Very good. Uh, now you're going to be, when people when people say seven years, you'll be able to say, like, back when I... Back in, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, make yourself sound a little old. <laughs> yeah, experience. Okay, radio license, when do we need that? International. International. International travel. The plane needs it, and who else needs it? The plane, and who else needs the... I'm not sure. The pilot, right? Okay. The pilot needs one as well. So, so when you go to the oh, airlines, yeah, yeah. you're going to have to get a radio license. You just... You pretty much just fill out a form and oh. submit like a forty dollar fee, and they you print it out. Okay. It's it's essentially a tax. Yeah. <laughs> but I have one with all my pilot documents still from flying with the airlines. Okay. You said those. You said the POH. Uh, did you say weight and balance? Yes, weight and balance. Okay. You said POH. You said weight and balance. So the weight and balance is what we talked about. That's where it would have the equipment list, right? With right. the mode C transponder. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting dynamic. You're at a flight school, right? And you're flying planes. So who is responsible to make sure that those planes are in airworthy condition when you go fly? Owner, owner and operator. 
So, but mm -hmm. at Fly School, more so the owner. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, our, uh, do you have any responsibility to make sure the planes? Yes, as the pilot in command, yes. Okay, so right, owner and operator, but if you're the operator, right, you're one of those. Right, right? one of those so that fall in that category. If you are either one of those, make sure you take, right, like full responsibility for it, right? Yeah. Okay, nice. Okay, so as far as maintaining the aircraft in an airworthy condition, what uh, inspections need to be uh, completed? Okay, yeah, so I need my annual, which is done every 12 calendar months, which is done every 20, uh, 12 calendar months, or half his life, half his battery uses, or hour of cumulative use. Very good. Um, All right. Now, uh, you said, which one was it? Shoot, what was that? Inspections. And also transponder every 24 calendar months. Oh, and the yeah. transponder. Every transponder every 24 calendar months. Yeah. Okay, in the transponder. Okay, so. I, think I missed you, that one. No worries, no worries. Yeah. You said. Keep playing how much annual. Okay, you said with 100 hours. You said it's 100 hours of tack time. Why is it not 100 hours of Hobbs time? Oh, I'm not. But I know it's 100 hour tack time. I. Okay, I, well, think I, about it. What's the difference? What's the difference between Hobbs time and tack time? I know tack time, uh, as soon as you turn the engine on, <laughs> that time on the tack starts to roll. But when does the Hobbs time start? I'm not sure. Okay, uh, it's it's not always the same on every plane, uh -huh. the way that it works, but it's usually when you turn on the battery master. Okay. When the, when the yeah, master on. Starts. Okay, yeah. Yeah. gotcha. So uh, that's why you can have discrepancies sometimes with flight times. If somebody turns it on and does their pre-flight and stuff, uh -huh. and it, it could click over and then they could take their, write their times down. Sometimes you can have discrepancies. Gotcha. But yeah, so Hobbs time isn't necessarily engine time, right? Mm -hmm. So we want engine time for maintenance when the engine's running, Correct. right? So that's why we don't use Hobbs time for that. So okay. it's whenever the engine's running with okay. tack time, which is usually like an oil pressure switch that causes that to go. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. So you got the inspections there. Inspections I want to talk about. Okay. What's the difference between an annual and a hundred hour inspection? Okay. Uh, so for an annual, can you ever fly beyond the annual? I can fly, uh, but I would just need permission. I would need a special flight permit from FISDO to get that to to be able to fly beyond that annual. Okay. And then as far as when the annual expires, let's say we had an annual that was accomplished January 15th, 2020. When does that expire? That would expire on January, the last day of January 31st, okay. 2024. Very good. So end of the month. All right. And then as far as 100 hour, can you ever fly 100 hour? You can, but you would have to be, uh, it'd have to be going to get your plane inspected for that 100 hour. Okay, so let's say the maintenance facility is here mm -hmm. at this airport, and let's say there is one hour of tack time left until the 100 hour. Can you go do a two hour flight? Does that count as on the way to the maintenance facility? Well, if the, if the inspection is here, then no, I would have to, I would, specific lights would be like my anti-collision lights. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to think about what you're looking for. <laughs> for what, what kind of required equipment for the plane? Oh, so you're talking about my VFR. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, my VFR. So, yeah, so I would, uh, my anti-collision lights. I usually better write this down. It's so a lot, isn't it? Anti-collision lights, temperature gauge, uh, my oil temperature gauge, uh, manifold pressure gauge to me. So, you said outside the plane, but I know my altimeter um, is one. And I'm not looking for just outside the plane. I'm looking for all, all okay, of them. Okay, all of them. Yeah. So, I guess I can open up to 91205 because I know where to find it. But uh, uh, I mean, do you know them? I do know them, yes. Let's let's do it without looking it up then. Okay, so anti-collision light, my temperature gauge, uh, all temperature gauge, manifold pressure gauge, uh, all pressure gauge, pressure gauge, uh, tachometer is another one, airspeed indicator, fuel quantity, fuel, fuel gauge, see the amount of fuel we have, <coughs> landing gear. So I said landing gear, I said anti-collision, airspeed indicator, altimeter, magnetic compass, my EOT and safety belts. Okay, you said landing gear. Is it the gear, the struts, or what is it we're looking for there? If you had a plane with retractable landing gear, then you have to make sure the landing gear light, you have a landing gear um, indicator. Indicator, there we go, okay, indicator. yeah, indicator. Okay, let's see, you also said, here, can you open that up? You said the fuel quantity, right? The fuel mm -hmm. quantity indicator. What if we have a multi-engine aircraft? Uh, do we need just one, or what's the requirement there? So you would, well, I'm sure I've never flown a multi, but I'm sure you need. Or, I'm sorry, that's a bad question. Not for that. For for our Cessnas, we have two fuel tanks. Mm -hmm. Do we, are we required to have one for the plane or how many do we need to have? You would need, uh, yeah, one for the plane. Do we have one in these Cessnas? Yes. There's only one? Huh? 
You go take a look if you. There's two. There's, there's two. two fuel yeah. quantity gauges. Okay. There's two fuel quantity indicators and there's two tanks, right? Okay. You need one for each, each fuel tank. tank. Okay. Yeah. Some planes have even more tanks than that. Well, I don't know if that's true actually, but yeah, I'll, every every tank needs a fuel quantity indicator. Okay. All right. Sweet. Okay, so you've you've uh, you've checked all your acquired equipment. Um, it's it is gonna the flight is gonna end at 9 p.m. though. So is there any other equipment that's required? Oh, so yeah, I would need my night uh, my night equipment, which is I like writing them down as well. So my uh, fuses, also landing uh, landing gear, source of electricity again, fuses, uh, position lights, and anti collision lights. Okay, uh, you s and landing light. I'm sorry. Landing light, yeah. You said landing gear the first time. Yeah, landing light, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, nice. So with the landing light, let's let's say that, let's change the scenario. Got your mic on. Check, check, check. Yep. Okay, cool. All right, so let's move on to different topic here. Let's see. Let's, let's talk about adverse yaw. What's adverse yaw? So adverse yaw is the plane's tendency to turn in the opposite, or yaw in the opposite direction of my turn. Okay, to yaw in the opposite direction of the turn, what causes that? Why does that happen? Because of induced drag and uh, the difference of drag and lift between uh, my wings. Okay, so which which one, tell me what's going on. Which which wing is experiencing something different? So, I, if I am turning to the left, my, so it is experiencing more drag because of the difference, it's experiencing more drag because of, uh, I'm trying to see how I explain it. Well, it, first off, it's experiencing more drag because of my flaps, first off. My uh, my right flap is extended downward, so. Uh, what do you mean by, I don't think you mean flaps, what do you mean? You flying with your flaps down? In not my flaps, not flaps, you're right, my yeah. aileron. Okay. Yeah, my aileron, uh, so my downward aileron uh, is causing it to give you more drag uh, on the right side. Okay, yeah. okay, so your your ailerons are in different positions. Correct. Okay, and so, no, left, left, left a turn to the right wing would be up. Yeah, so you said it would yaw to the outside of the turn, right? Mm -hmm. So which wing has more drag? So that would mean my left wing would have. Very good, when we talked yesterday, <laughs> I said adverse yaw, what's the first thing you say? Induced drag. Induced drag, right? Mm -hmm. Induced drag, so what causes induced drag? So that because the surface of my, 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 my plane, the shape of my plane causes induced drag. Simpler, what, ca what causes, like, why is it induced drag and not parasitic drag? Because it's generating that, something, right? Because it's generating lift. Generating lift. So induced drag is a byproduct of lift, right? Mm -hmm. It's producing more lift and my, therefore more drag. drag. Oh, yeah. My bad. So, yeah. So, yeah, as I turn to the left, my right wing is producing more lift, therefore more drag. Okay. Because of the cord line, right, of the wing with the aileron down, increases your angle of attack, aileron up, decreases your angle of attack, right? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you got it. It's just connecting the dots all the way through the explanation, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, whenever you hear what is adverse yaw, your your answer is it's it's because of induced drag on the upward wing, right? Mm -hmm. Causes that aircraft to yaw to the outside of the turn. So why does that happen? Because the cord line of each wing is being changed when those ailerons move, right? They're moving in opposite directions. So you don't necessarily need to get into the weeds of, you know, of what exactly is happening with the cord line unless he asks you, because that could be kind of confusing. But you just say that when the ailerons move, the cord line changes, right? So it's producing more lift on the upward wing, therefore more induced drag. Okay, getting the call. Oh, she called. Well, all right, so that's adverse, y'all. So let's try this again. What's adverse yaw? All right, so adverse yaw is the tendency for my plane to want to yaw in the opposite direction of my turn. Very good, okay. that's a perfect answer. Mm -hmm. Now, why? Uh, this occurs because when I'm making a turn to a left, my right wing is creating more lift and therefore more drag, causing it to yaw in the... Come on, you got it, nice job. All right, let's see. I wanna check real quick. the. Camera went to sleep right at the end of the previous one, so I'm just gonna make sure it's not doing that this time. Cool, it's not. All right, okay, uh, a little bit more with aerodynamics. What's what's happening when a wing stalls? When a wing stalls, it is exceeding its critical angle of attack. Okay, very good. So, the critical angle of attack is the point that, well, when the wing, how would I, I feel like I'm stumbling now, man. So that's the point where the air, where the, where the wing, when uh, when the airfoil does not, uh, we're not generating enough lift uh, underneath our wing, so that will mean our critical angle of attack has been exceeded. Okay, not generating enough lift is when it happens. So what makes the critical angle of attack critical? What's what's difference between the critical angle of attack and 
every other angle of attack. I'll ask you this, what, what is angle of attack? What is that angle? How do we get that angle? It's, it's gonna be the difference the, between two things, right? That angle between the, yeah, when we exceed the angle between the relative wind and car line, right? Is that how I would do it? I mean, I maybe didn't set that up the best there. And basically, critical angle of attack is when you exceed the angle of attack at which the laminar airflow, right, going over the wing, can continue traveling down the wing, right, and it starts to separate rapidly, mm -hmm. right, from the top of the wing. So that's where you see, you know, the picture in the, I think it's the P-hack, where the air is, like, spinning off the top of the wing mm -hmm. instead of flowing down, right? So at a certain point, which is our critical angle of attack, the air can no longer travel down because you're moving it further and further away from the relative wind, right? Guess, it wants I guess to that's go this what way. I meant too, that's just by generating lift, because that's because that is ultimately how we generate the lift, though, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Sorry, we keep playing for nah. <laughs> Yeah. So critical angle of attack, attack is the angle of attack at which the air begins to separate from the top of the wing. Okay. Okay. That's that's the kind of the short and sweet, and then you can get into it more of talking about you know, the relative wind can only change direction so much from its initial direction, but um, that's basically it. Okay. Okay. Man, I don't know what it is for me. I don't know if it's the camera or, man, do Yeah, don't, wor don't worry about it. I know the camera is a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to edit out all that stuff, though. So, I mean, overall, I would say you are doing well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least if you say that, that means more than what I'm thinking there, probably. I don't know. <laughs> what, when you have, like, every day we take off into the wind, right? That's what we try to do, at least, mm -hmm. for the most part. Why do we take off into the wind? To, to decrease runway usage. So what happens to our... It's gonna indicate faster because we have more wind. Let's talk about in cruise. That might be a little confusing to think about it on takeoff. In cruise, let's say we're flying with a 20 knot headwind and we're at 100 knots indicated. Our ground speed is gonna be slower. Our ground speed is slower, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but our indicated speed is not affected by the headwind, right? Okay. It's, we're at 100 knots still traveling mm -hmm. through the air. So even if the headwind went away, we would still be at 100 knots. We just would be moving faster over the ground, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, so let's talk about a little bit of weather information. What's the standard temperature and pressure values? Uh, standard temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. For, I guess I should say for sea level. For sea level. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, standard temperature is 15 degrees Celsius and uh, standard pressure is 29.92. Okay, what about here? So here at uh, DFW, mm -hmm. uh, so that standard pressure is, standard temperature is 15 degrees Celsius and... Uh, is it? Are we at sea level? No. Okay, okay. so, so we, how does we, that change? So as, uh, as our elevation changes, so does the pressure. So uh, as we get higher in elevation, pressure uh, decreases. Our weather, so um, ATIS. So yeah, our, uh, yeah. yeah, our ATIS tells us the non-standard. So. That's where we're getting the non-standard pressure, right? Our, our altitude doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be higher or lower here than somewhere else, right? Because, I mean, sometimes we have less than 2992 here, sometimes we have more. It, it depends on the weather fluctuations, right? So that is just non-standard pressure. So we'll get that from the ATIS, but the temperature specifically, that, that's different depending on your altitude. That's, I think you might be getting that confused. So what happens to the temperature as we climb? It gets cooler. Yeah, it gets cooler. The, the standard temperature is cooler as we climb because there's what's called the lapse rate, right? Mm -hmm. So what is a standard lapse rate? Decreases by two degrees? D I'm sorry, decreases by okay. two degrees yeah. every thousand Decreases. Feet. Okay, so what altitude are we at here? Uh, we're at uh, 6,100. 661. 661, okay. Mm -hmm. So then what is standard temperature here, considering the lapse rate. Okay, so it would be about standard temperature. Yeah, you don't have to give me like a, an exact number. You yeah, can just so, um, add, sorry, 29.21. Confusing temperature and pressure again. We're talking temperature, Okay. right? What, so what, again, let's say what standard temperature at sea level? 15, right? Yeah. So then what is, if it's that at sea level, how do we know the difference between sea level and you said 661 feet? Well, so I know that uh, it, we go up every thousand feet, we uh, we gain two degrees Celsius. So we would be a little bit above 16, 16.1 or two. So it's getting hotter as we climb? I'm sorry, <laughs> man, I'm discombobulated, man. You're good, you're good. They're you're like going. about 13.9. Okay, yeah. we're gonna have a lap straight as it gets cooler. And if you wanted to, to do the exact math, you could, but let's just, the conversation today, uh -huh. let's say it was a thousand feet. 
we would decrease our temperature by two degrees, right? Mm -hmm. So standard at a thousand feet is 13 degrees, is mm -hmm. our new standard at that altitude. So whenever you're hearing standard temperature pressure, remember that that is only standard at sea level, right? For 15 degrees and 2992. Okay. Okay, it's not necessarily standard for other places. Okay, all right, Let's see. Okay, uh, what must be present in order for a thunderstorm to form? So for a thunderstorm to form, we must have well, uh, unstable lapse rate, visible moisture, and also lifting activity. Okay, so you mentioned lapse rate. W what, what's an unstable lapse rate? So we talked about a standard lapse rate. What, what would be an unstable lapse rate? An uh, unstandard lapse rate, an uh, unstable lapse rate would not do that. It may increase or fluctuate as we go up. Yeah, so if it was changing much faster than that, right, mm -hmm. that would be an unstable lapse rate because the temperature is changing very quickly, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Nice. And where, how would you figure out what the actual lapse rate is that day? Is there a way that we could find that? Yes, there is a way we can find that. I can look it up on Four Flight. So where, where on? I'm, I'm looking for what's the source of that information, right? Oh, so aviationweather.gov. We can probably find it, or uh, flight service station could give us the lapse rate. Okay, yeah, flight service station. You could ask them some information about it. On, let's say we looked on aviationweather.gov. What, what uh, would you look at though to find the lapse rate? Uh, I would look at my uh, winds and temperatures aloft, and that's going to give you right at zero, three thousand, six thousand feet, yeah. whatever your different temperatures, and you can interpolate from there. Right. right. All right. Very nice. So, if you wanted to see, hmm, are we going to have thunderstorms develop? You could go and look at your winds and temperature aloft chart and find out if you have an unstable <coughs> lapse rate that day, mm -hmm. and it's got the forecast as well, right, further out. So you could see hey, around you know midnight tonight, we're supposed to have a pretty quickly changing temperature between these altitudes, and then you could look at your humidity, your other factors as well, and see if, if you're gonna have a thunderstorm. All right, becoming weatherman, right? All right, uh, then what, what are the stages of a thunderstorm? So stages of a thunderstorm, cumulative stage, mature stage, and dissipating stage. Okay, all right, yeah, and uh, yeah, on the check ride, just answer the question. If uh, they want you to go into more detail, they'll tell you. So what, let's see, wh what characterizes the, the, let's say the dissipating stage? Uh, downdraft, so when rain is kind of fading away. Okay, downdrafts. All right, uh, and then how far away do you want to stay from a thunderstorm? 20 nautical miles away from a thunderstorm. Okay, why? Because the effects of a thunderstorm can impact you even if you're not right under it. So 20 nautical miles is a safe distance to stay away from anything like maybe hail that may shift your way or any rain that may affect visibility. Okay, uh, yeah, for a private pilot you may be concerned with, with visibility. <clears throat> what other uh, factors could be a safety issue from a thunderstorm? So, so there is moisture, so depending on the temperature and how high you're up, uh, maybe icing could be a thing. I'm assuming you're looking for something else. Well, you said hail. Mm -hmm. You said reduced visibility, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want to fly in, in IMC conditions as a private pilot. Mm -hmm. Also, you don't want to fly into clouds around a thunderstorm anyways, right? Because you could have an embedded thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. You said icing. What else? Also winds as well. Yeah, wind, turbulence, turbulence right? Yeah, bad turbulence as well. Uh -huh. Anything else? Let's see, what else would a thunderstorm? What's it called? Thunderstorm? Remember last time, what causes the thunder? What causes the thunderstorm? No, the thunder. Oh, oh, well, lightning. There you go. Lightning. lightning right? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Man, maybe I should have eaten before I came. <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we want to cover here. Okay, so let's say you're out flying and there's uh, a thunderstorm and the airport that you want to fly here and 40 miles away you have a thunderstorm here. Okay, so airport, thunderstorm, thunderstorm, and you're here. Would you fly into that airport because you, like you said, you want to stay 20 miles away, you'd be 20 miles from both thunderstorms. Would you go to that airport? I would not fly between two thunderstorms, no. Okay. What, what do you think would be a safe distance between to actually go between them? Or is there? So if I'm going between two thunderstorms, again, I want to be, uh, you said, we said 20 nautical miles away from them, but if I want to even divert or to move further away in any, any time during flight, that would put me too close to mm -hmm. the other thunderstorm if I were to go in between them both. Very good, yeah. yeah. So you need the ability to divert, something happens, yes. go somewhere else. And I mean, thunderstorms can move pretty fast sometimes, right? right? Like they can, sometimes you'll, you'll look up those winds and they're going 50, even faster miles an hour. So yeah, you don't want to go between them. You could get into a pretty bad situation there. Right? Now, if they're a thousand miles apart, then that's a different story. Yeah. But if they're 40 miles apart, 
we're not doing that, right? Right. Um, as well, like you said before, not all of the factors require you to be in the thunderstorm or under them. You could be even five miles away and you could get hit by hail or right. something like that, right? All right, very good. Okay, so let's say that you are here in flight. Let's keep this situation going. You're here, thunderstorm, thunderstorm, the airport you wanted to go, and you feel like you need some help to figure out what's going on with weather and you wanna call somebody to get help. What, who would you call on the radio? Uh, so I would call a flight service station okay. and uh, let them help me or give me advice on it, well, if it'd be a good flight or not. Even, obviously we would know if they're 40 miles apart. My instincts would probably tell me not to fly though. Okay, yeah. and then uh, what frequency would you contact them on? For uh, 122.2. Potentially. Well, how would you find out if that is the correct frequency? Oh uh, well, so if that's the case, well, we can, we can contact Addis, right? But I can find out if 122.2 is the correct frequency. If On the ATIS? No, that's no, not, not on. Tell you. Is that what you said? No, I'm saying uh, I can also, I was saying I can contact ATIS because uh, it sounds like you're saying at first, I thought you were asking me, um, how can we find out before flight if it would be safe to oh, fly no. through? So I'm, <coughs> no, I'm already how in would flight. You, how would you find the flight service station's frequency? On the sectional. On the sectional. Okay, yeah. so if you looked on the sectional, it would be on there. Okay, yeah, yeah very good. Okay, so they <coughs> can give you any kind of information, right? Like thunderstorm information, notums, airmet sigmets, right? They can give you that kind of stuff. Okay, so talking about the, we were talking about the ATIS earlier. Well, no. Let's let's talk about a METAR. What is a METAR? What kind of information are you going to find there? So METAR is a weather advisory for the airport. It is going to give us the date and time, visibility, cloud ceilings, wind speeds, temperature, and also remarks. I feel like I'm missing something, but um, if I saw a METAR in front of me, I would mm -hmm. you definitely know what they are. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and say, mm -hmm, what do I want to check on the ATIS? Let's, let's pull up an ATIS. Let's just go ahead and do that. All right. So there's the ATIS. Don't scroll down there to the, to the answers. What is that telling us? Okay. So this gives us the airport. All right. Hold on. The I'm going to screenshot it. So I have it for the video later. Okay. Okay. So this gives us the airport, the time in Zulu. This gives us our wind speeds and uh, sky conditions as well. Uh, temperature dew point, uh, altimeter, and remarks. Okay, so what is the time and date? That time is okay. so the day of the month. So what is it though? Uh, so this is the eleventh day of the. It says it's mentioning the first day of the month, and eighteen fifty three Zulu. There you go. Okay, <clears throat> eighteen fifty three Zulu. Okay, what's the the wind? The direction. Okay, oh. is that direction it's going towards or coming from? This coming from. Okay. What's the next one there? SLP 136. The sea level pressure, uh, it's a different way of measuring pressure. Um, we have the A2995 that we use, so um, that's not something that we use for our flying, but it's good to still know what it is. It's another way of measuring pressure. Sea level pressure. And then what's oh, that no. last one? Do you know what that one is? No. Okay, so the T, it's temperature. So it's, it's the same as this one up here. You see 23, and that one's 23.3. Four, and that one's 3.9. That's how you read it. Okay. So it's just giving you another decimal point, okay. basically, More of, accurate. of the temperature. Yeah. Which, for our purposes, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't you know, one degree of temperature that doesn't accurate. really yeah. change much for us. But for, for certain things, that could be helpful. Okay. Good job reading the METAR. So with those conditions, would you go fly today? Uh, yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, 10 miles visibility. Yep. Temperature, no rain. Winds were... Pretty good, yeah. Okay. So to my minimum. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's do a TAF as well. What is, I'll pull up a TAF here for you. What is a TAF? Terminal air drone forecast. Okay, um, uh, and where, <laughs> what does that apply to? What, what airport, uh, airspace, whatever, what does that apply so to? So it applies to the airport and also um, surrounding areas. Okay, so, uh, what so is it? I'm sorry, here we go. Okay, uh, okay. The first day of May, first day of the month, mm -hmm. 1720 Zulu, 011 slash 028. We'll go come back to that one. 